Hello. Oh, oh, what happened to my voice there? <laughs> it just suddenly went very high. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> I hope you're doing well. I hope your reading year is going well so far. I always get quite excited in January uh, because, you know, just the, the feeling of, oh, what am I going to read first this year? And uh, I read a number of books. I read nine in total. Some were great and uh, really interesting and moving experiences. Others I had slight issues with. And and uh, some parts of them didn't quite work for me, uh, so it was quite a, a mixed experience uh, this month. But I did find, as I often find with most reading months, that just coincidentally some of the books I was reading, there was a crossover of, of themes or ideas, and I always find that one of the really surprising and interesting things about reading a number of different things in a short space of time that you'll find these overlaps in between different books in terms of subject matter and uh, so yeah so I'm going to point out some of that as well as talking about all of my thoughts about these books and first off on um, the very first things I began reading this year uh, were two books uh, which were dealing with pandemics and I know a lot of you are feeling like oh I don't want to think about pandemics or read about them or, or you know, because you want to read for escapism because so much for the past couple years all anyone has been talking about is the global pandemic and how are you reacting to it? How is it affecting you? How is it going to change everything? And, and yeah, I get exhausted with it as well. Uh, but also this has been a monumental thing in society that's really shaped our world in the past couple of years and is continuing to shape it and you know might occur in the future if there are more pandemics or if there's a new variant and um, so yeah I think it is worth thinking about but also I think there's a kind of cathartic release of reading books uh, about it sort of by reading about these um, kind of dystopian futures where the world has been so drastically shaped by it and uh, so yeah I, I, I did really uh, enjoy reading um, the, these books um, to paradise I mean the the pandemic part of it is really only in the second half of the book or the third book in um, this uh, this really big long novel and uh, but also in How High We Go in the Dark by Sequoia Nagamatsu um, which is his debut novel and interestingly both these books I think have quite uh, unique structures to them and how they present this this subject matter and especially this which is shaped more like a collection of short stories and even though this is his debut novel he has previously published a collection of short stories and so you can kind of tell that that's the kind of writing he's come out of um, but they there are connections between the characters and uh, progression in time and uh, yeah and reworking um, a certain theme which is uh, at the very beginning of this this novel a uh, disease is unearthed in um, in the Arctic because the Arctic is thawing and it releases this um, disease which has been encased in the ice um, with these these individuals that were frozen in the ice and um, and now it's come back out into the world and it's uh, affected everyone and you see the sort of breakdown of society how society comes back together and communities come back together uh, but also the process of how individuals and communities grieve uh, for who what it, the, the people who have been lost but also this lifestyle um, which has been lost in, in the process and uh, I think it's really moving how it does that and does so in very um, yeah in these these individual uh, sort of stories and circumstances which are are quite uh, fantastical in um, and so it's it almost works as a kind of like on the surface this feels almost like a sci-fi novel because there's a lot in it to do with technology there's one section that deals with um, these uh, uh, audio animatronic dogs um, which are kind of comfort dogs for people and a man who repairs them uh, another um, section is about a, a pig that has been being um, 
it's like tampering with its genetics and so this pig starts to talk and so there's this like consciousness but also in the later stories it's uh, moving into space in this uh, spaceship which goes searching for another earth which seems to be you know well trod path now in talking about environmentalism so on the surface it's almost like sci-fi but it's really about the deeply moving human stories at, at the center of this and people's connections with each other and and following those uh, over the the course of the story and so you get the individual instance of um, you know the subject matter that um, each chapter is dealing with uh, but then you gradually start to see connections between uh, the characters and what has happened to some of the characters over a period of time and uh, and how that that builds um, is is quite a, a moving experience. So yeah, I really enjoyed and, and appreciated this this debut novel. I thought there was a lot of innovative things about it and it was quite a, a gripping uh, experience. Now, I, I did also read um, To Paradise, um, which I made a whole video about and, and a lot of the issues I I had with it. And uh, and like I remarked in a, a previous video, like I think it's interesting that Tanya Yanagahara wrote this uh, or you know had the idea for this um, before the pandemic hit and so was writing about pandemics before you know that happened but uh, but was still writing the novel you know as the pandemic was the recent pandemic was going on and so um, so incorporated that into the story and uh, and yeah and I still like sort of wonder like overall how this novel hangs together since the three different parts of it are really like separate novels and and I think in some ways it, it really doesn't but you can see thematic links to it and and issues which are covered over all of the novels but uh but yeah i i mean the, but the actual reading experience of each of these books is is so pleasurable and and just recently i uh watched um the the film adaptation of washington square by henry james which the first part of this book is really massively inspired by and uh and in a sort of Mousy heiress um, who uh, a charismatic young man um, starts courting her and the same thing occurs in the beginning of this novel but it's between two men and it's set in this revised vi vision of um, the, the past where homosexuality was legal in this certain section of a different version of the United States um, which has been partitioned into all these interesting different parts and interestingly Maine um, which is the state I was born and raised in, um, is its own special sections. There are these different factions of um, the, these different countries within the United States, but Maine sort of exists on its own as <laughs> for and um, and yeah, and as for sort of like trade and and uh, and yeah, and I just have found it that kind of funny that it just sort of stands out on its on its own. And uh, yeah, and it's really interesting following the ongoing discussions and conversation and debate around this this novel which I think it's only natural that it encourages because Yanagahara writes in such a, a readable way. Um, in, I, I was so engaged with each section of this book, but then at the same time, I'm like, well, does it all really hang together? And yeah, there's... I, I think it's quite justified. There's lots of questions about the the way she writes and um, yeah, the, the subject matter she chooses and the way she chooses to structure it, um, which is really ambitious and interesting. But yeah, at the same time, I understand all the debate around it. I also read two brand new novels, um, which both happen to be about uh, women that walk out on their lives and uh, like physically travel to somewhere else and uh, try to start anew. And uh, this is really interesting for me because one of my favorite novels of all time is Ann Tyler's uh, novel, Ladder of Years, um, which is about a woman that just wakes up one morning and decides to leave her, her house and her life and everyone she knows and goes to, to live on her own in a, in a house and just wants to like read and be by herself and have some time to herself and uh, yeah I've just always been so fascinated by that concept of people that walk out on their lives and um, so these books explore this this same theme in, in um, some quite interestingly different ways um, so first there's Wayward by Dana Spiotta um, which is uh, who I've never read before and I've always been curious to, to read her writing um, I think this is her maybe third or fourth novel and uh, so this is about a, a woman a, a 
wife and mother uh, who uh, is uh, in her early 50s and she uh, yeah just sort of wakes up one day and is like, well, that's it, I'm, I'm leaving. And uh, so she um, walks out, tells her husband um, that she's uh, bought a new house. Um, she, she finds this sort of art house uh, that's in a city um, that is really run down and she purchases it sort of on a whim and uh, moves there. And uh, so leaves her husband and her teenage daughter. And, uh, and I thought it was going to be much more about her sort of building a new life for herself in this house and sort of renovating the house and, you know, sort of making it her, her own since it's like really run down, um, which I mean, it is about in a way, but it like deals with the technicalities of that in a very brusque way. It just sort of like, and she fixed the electrics and the, the um, plumbing or she got people in to, to do that. And, um, and then that was sort of it. And, uh, but then goes on much more to how she's, Kind of searching for a sense of community, I think, or, or people that she can connect to because she feels very out of place since uh, her her mother is suffering from a, an illness which her, her mother won't divulge to her. And so she's tense about that. Her teenage daughter is growing increasingly estranged from her. And, uh, and so she's just feeling very out of place. And also this is set when Trump just is inaugurated into uh, into the White House, and um, so she's very stressed about that. And she tries to join uh, different women's groups that are responding to this political change. Um, first, physically um, going to a group um, which doesn't really work out, and then online. And uh, and so it's about an individual um, from a group of people that I think feel that their voices aren't really being heard of of women in um, middle age that uh, yeah aren't aren't being represented uh, in America anymore and so I think this novel is really a response to that and her experiences meeting some people online um, who um, have some quite extreme views and um, and really questionable views and her meeting up IRL in real life with some of those people and and the uh, the difficulty of that and uh, the the drama of that, uh, as well as the drama of her continuing to deal with her family and her um, her husband who um, she has left, but they still continue to have relationships with each other. Um, he comes over for a booty call every once in a while, you know, which is on her terms and uh, her trying to navigate her relationship with her daughter and trying to express herself and uh, her connection with her mother. And so it, it is in some ways about the different physical places that we inhabit and the homes we make for ourselves and what those say about our lives, how those either uh, inhibit our lives or are beautiful representations of our identity. And, and uh, so I think it is interesting how it tackles that, but I would say on the whole, I, I thought this novel was just sort of fine. I, I um, So like I admired all those aspects of it that I, I talked about it, but is a book that I more admired the concept of it than enjoyed the, the actual experience of, of reading it, I would say. And for uh, Tides by Sarah Freeman, this is um, a debut novel as well and um, is uh, also about a woman that uh, at the very beginning of the novel um, we meet her when she uh, arrives at a seaside town, a very affluent seaside town, and she herself doesn't really have any money and we learned that she's walked away from her family and her household and her life and uh, we don't know why at first that has happened. We gradually discover it over the course of the, the book, so there's the mystery of that, um, but also it follows just her day-to-day -day life in this uh, small seaside town and which she's arrived at sort of at the end of the season. It's a kind of vacation spot. So in the summer, it gets very busy. And then in the winter, it's more about the, the fewer residents who actually inhabit it year round. And, and, um, and so and it's uh, quite poignant that she arrives sort of towards the end of the season and continues to stay there because um, it, it's a sort of a, a physical place and a town um, which is out of time, you know, out of the, the busy summer season. And she is sort of out of time herself with where she is in her life. Um, she 
thought she would be at a certain point of uh, being a wife and a mother and um, belonging to a family, but that hasn't really worked out. And, um, and it's quite moving how it follows her, her journey and, and her psychological process of uh, living in this town and just kind of existing on her own, trying, wanting to build a new life for herself, but finding memories of her life flooding back in and um, and it's described quite poetically you know there's this image of the tides and the movement of water and she'll she'll go out swimming in the middle of the night and um, and she'll and she she drinks quite a lot and doesn't eat very much and so she's not really caring for herself she doesn't really have uh, any more self-respect or, or um, value for her own life because she's at this perilous point where, where she doesn't really know where she fits in or, or what she wants. And she develops a relationship with a man in this town um, who similarly is sort of out of place in his life. And uh, so I think it's quite interesting how it follows their parallel journeys and um, and her process of trying to um, yeah, claim a, a life for herself. And written in this very like sparse way, you can see like there's um, short paragraphs and lots of blank spaces on the page in between these paragraphs. And it, and this does like add to it and emphasize and make it f feel like this meditative stip space that she's entered where she's just trying to understand what has happened to her and what she wants. And, and I feel like it's kind of uh, sorting through, I'm not really connected with it in that when we're like sifting through memories of the past, we can tend to start berating ourselves for what we feel like we should have done and didn't do and how people reacted to us. And, and, um, and so it's really to do with self-esteem and, and this slow building of, of self-esteem over time. And I think it's quite poetic and powerful um, how she, she does that in this novel. So, um, so yeah, this was a, a really strong book. I also read the novel More Than I Love My Life by David Grossman, uh, which was published last year. And uh, this, this novel was fascinating, um, really interestingly structured. Um, it's about a, a family uh, who are making a document of the grandmother of the family, uh, Vera's life. Um, so she's a Yugoslavian immigrant who, who moved to a kibbutz in Israel with her daughter in the 1960s. And there um, she, um, she's lost her husband and she, she had lost her husband in Yugoslavia um, during uh, political and uh, conflict and war. And, uh, and in this kibbutz, um, she meets a man um, who she remarries and has a relationship with. And um, this man had a son named Raphael and Vera brought her daughter Nina to this kibbutz. And uh, Nina and Raphael also develop a relationship um, sort of around the same time that their parents got together, um, but it's a very uneven relationship. And Nina has a lot of uh, issues and um, hang-ups and um, trauma that she's uh, lived through um, from their experiences in Yugoslavia. And uh, and so it skips forward in time when um, the, the actual narrator of the story is the daughter, um, Gili, of, uh, of Nina and Raphael. And um, so much later in time, in uh, 2008, I think it is, uh, when um, she is narrating the the history of her family and uh, looking back to the 60s when her grandparents and her parents got together in this kibbutz and um, but uh, she she doesn't even really introduce herself till a bit of a distance into the novel um, because she is so fascinated with sifting through the past of her family and trying to figure out what happened to them and why her mother made the choices, her mother Nina made the choices uh, she did because she has a lot of anger towards Nina and complicated feelings about her and Nina's been physically absent for a lot of her life so she's mostly grown up with her father Raphael who uh, is a photographer and um, a videographer and he's passed that on to, to Gilly as well um, who also works on films and documentaries and so they decide they want to make a documentary about Vera, the grandmother of the family and travel back to Yugoslavia with her and try to discover her past. And so it starts with Vera's 
birthday, her 90th birthday, um, which Nina arrives at and attends. Um, she's been living in a remote location in Scandinavia, and she returns there, and, um, and they set off on this journey. The second half of the book is basically following their journey and trying to make this documentary and it brings up a lot of issues and drama to do with the past, and it is um, it is very dramatic how it does that. There's a lot of revelations and things that are revealed. Um, so it, it sounds like quite complicated um, on the surface of it, but um, but it, it sort of all makes sense as you're following this family and their, their journey, and uh, and I, I thought it was so good. It's, it's so fascinating how, we look at at uh, memories of uh, the past and like the what has been passed down through generations and what has been documented and what those documents really say about the past, what they leave out about the past, um, the the gaps that are filled in, the the truth that is passed down, the the truth which is silenced and and not passed down, and it and it looks at all of those questions to do with these things like sort of almost in real time as they're making this documentary so they're they're struggling with all these issues and trying to work them out uh, as as they're going through this this process of traveling through this physical landscape and re-experiencing all of the the memories that that uh, that Vera went through um, during this this uh, the the time of conflict in the, the Balkans and um, so yeah it's uh, it's it's really interesting um, how it handles all the the personal and political on um, these different levels but is also a, a really gripping and emotional story as you feel the the push and pull between the characters and their alliances with each other and uh, their the the bitter resentments which um, come to the surface and and emerge and um, this these different family conflicts um, so if you're looking at a really good story about family conflict and like negotiating with uh, memories and issues to do with the past. Um, it, this is a fantastic book. I also happened to read a couple of novels um, which are to do with uh, characters that are deaf family members. Um, so there's What Willow Says by Lynn Buckle, um, which is about uh, narrated from the point of view of a grandmother um, who has a deaf granddaughter. And then there's uh, Strangers I Know by Claudia Durastanti, who is an uh, Italian author um, that is uh, writing about the experience of uh, two deaf parents and it's, it's sort of I think semi autobiographical um, but uh, but yeah the the lines between a uh, sort of fiction and autobiography kind of blur in in this book so in what Willow says it's quite a short um, poetically charged novel um, written in this very sparse style where the grandmother is writing these journal entries about her experiences with her granddaughter, trying to form a language with her granddaughter because uh, her her granddaughter um, is just learning sign language, uh, but um, which she is able to pick up fairly quickly. But the, the grandmother um, finds it much more difficult to learn sign language because she's of a more advanced age and, um, yeah, and just finds it really difficult. And um, I think she's dealing with her own hearing issues as, as well. And so how they try to form their own unique language with each other by going out into the natural world and almost taking tips from you know the movement of trees and the way that nature communicates um, with itself in order to communicate with each other their 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 emotions and their thoughts and their ideas with each other and it's so beautiful how it describes that I mean first off I just sort of love this book because each entry begins with an account of the weather and I think my, my own grandmother um, had a journal where she sort of recorded the weather every day and it just sort of feels like some of um, people of a certain generation that's what they say naturally feel inclined to record first off but of course in this novel it becomes uh, these observations about the weather become much more about her psychological and spiritual state and uh, and so yeah it's it's following their interactions with each other um, being in nature, but also their interactions with the, the community, with um, the granddaughter going to, to school and seeing different specialists um, who are trying to assist with her hearing condition and interacting with other members of the, the deaf community. And so it's, um, but it's 
primarily about this like intense um, relationship between the the grandmother and the granddaughter and uh, yeah it's just so lovely how it, it um it describes that and the their um their their frustrations in trying to communicate certain things but then also when things are conveyed how it's almost even more meaningful because they found their own language to to create that and and it's about the the process of trying to communicate with each other and and what can't be said and what can be said and uh, but but yeah also the larger issue to do with how society deals with deafness and and uh, trying to normalize um, people who have hearing issues to uh, into uh, the the larger society and and the the conflicts um, surrounding that and uh, and so I thought it was really moving how it it did that um, but in some ways I felt like the the writing was slightly too poetic or, or and I, I like that the grandmother is basically like in an, an, an aging hippie um, it describes how she had gone to stay in, uh, on an ashram at one point and and um, and so she she feels this wrong really strong connection with the natural world but it's it's she describes her experiences in, in a way which is sort of so heightened in some sections that I just I had struggled a bit to understand what was actually going on at some points so I did have some slight issue with that and also um, it, it describes how um, she is uh, recording the, the trees that they encounter and is trying to make drawings of them and um, and I, I wish that some of those drawings had been reproduced in the text because I feel like that would have enhanced it and, and made it come to life and given it a different dimension and it's kind of interesting because um, Sean the book maniac on his channel he interviewed Lynn Buckle uh, about this book and her reading in general which is really interesting to to watch and I'll put a link to it below um, but Lynn Buckle commented in that that um, after the publication of this novel she because she's also a visual artist and and she has gone to on to um, create some artworks which are basically the the trees which the grandmother is um, creating in this book um, so I, I'd love to see some of those and and uh, and if this is reprinted it would be wonderful if some of those were included uh, alongside the the text uh, then I uh, read strangers I know by Claudia Durastanti and so this is this begins very much with an account of the, the narrator uh, describing her experiences with uh, two deaf parents and how she's not able to directly communicate with her parents because her she's um, never learned the sign language um, that her parents use and her parents use different forms of sign language. They um, aren't able to communicate too much in a direct way, but her parents um, lip read and uh, and um, and they they speak so um so they are able to mostly communicate, but um but yeah there are challenges to do with that. But also her parents have conflicting stories about their lives. The beginning of this book is really an account of her family and trying to reconstruct what um, what actually happened in her family and giving an account of their their lives and uh, but also it's a kind of coming of age tale following her her story as uh, she is moving forward in her life and moving to different places and uh, trying to establish herself and have relationships with uh, with people um, both like friendships and romantic relationships and so describing her journey in that way and a lot of reflections on um, larger society but um, yeah also ways of communicating with each other and and there's a lot of interesting and sort of tantalizing detail in this I, I do like all the the details that are worked into it but then there's also lots of ideas and so I feel like this book is almost like a hybrid between a coming-of-age novel and an essay collection and I think it's really interesting when novels experiment in that way and you know you can create a, a story in um, any way you want to um, but that doesn't always quite work out and I don't think it quite worked out in this novel in that it just wasn't totally satisfying in either 
of those respects in that uh, there were details about her life which I feel like were left off. There, there are certain sections where she talks about a friend that suffers from drug addiction or um, another like story about a certain family member. And it's like, well, I want more of that story because it's just sort of brought in and left there and not really developed over a long period of time. And the same thing is true with all of the ideas she was working with in this novel and that she'll introduce an idea or concept to do um, you know, with communication or politics or larger society. And then it's just sort of dropped and not really explored as much as I felt like it should have been. Um, so yeah, there was lots of parts of this book that I thought were really interesting, but a novel as a whole, I don't think it quite worked. And I also finished reading two novels um, which are set in the 19th century, um, in the 1800s. Um, in the case of uh, Anthony Trollope's novel, it was actually written in the, the mid to late 1800s and uh, Born of No Woman uh, by Frank uh, Boyce, um, which is a French novel um, uh, translated and published uh, last year in uh, the UK. And uh, yeah, and this is a novel set in the 19th century in rural France. And uh, yeah, this, this novel uh, I was really excited about because it has a kind of gothic type setting and set up to it. And the beginning of the novel starts out really well um, when a, a priest is uh, brought to, uh, to attend the body and give the last rites of a, of a um, body at an insane asylum and uh, a woman that has died. And he has passed um, the journals of, a, of this woman uh, by um, someone that works at the, the institute and um, which was hidden on the woman's person and, and is an account of her life. Um, which was suppressed and she wasn't able to uh, tell her own story and so now her story has been passed on to this priest um, who takes it and reads it over a number of years and so you get in her journalist account of her life but also the accounts of some other people in her life. Um, so she was a girl um, that was born to this poor farming family and is basically the eldest daughter of this family and she's basically sold to a uh, wealthy family living in this castle um, to be a servant there and so she's sold into this indentured servitude but there are a lot of sinister things going on at this castle and with the the lord of the the, the castle and his mother and uh, and you gradually discover that over the course of the book and um, and so yeah it's a very like gothic type setting um, with a lot of intrigue and, and violence and darkness to it and I was really excited about that but it just didn't really work for me. Um, I think partly in the way that it was structured in that I, I almost wish it had just been her journal which was reproduced and so we just got her perspective because it when it goes into the points of view of different people in her life like her father and another man that lives on the estate and the the lord of the estate then it um it it kind of detracts from it because uh, i think those accounts first off it just makes me wonder like well how do why are we getting their perspective and their point of view and um because it has this this structure of like her journals, which are left behind, uh, but but also it's yeah those those accounts are quite flat and one dimensional and um, and quite obvious I, I felt and so I would have rather just had her own voice and her complicated perspective and we could glean from her point of view the the truth of um, these other people around her which so I don't think they were entirely necessary. I mean, she's the most complex and interesting character in it. And also uh, it built up to this conclusion where there are twists and a reveal. And um, so, you know, there is a big secret to this novel. So if you want to read it for that thrilling aspect, I guess it's kind of interesting, but I just found it difficult to emotionally invest in the story to really care about those twists. So when they came, I yeah just didn't really care about them and they didn't it didn't um it didn't uh, entirely work for me and so yeah it just felt like on the whole this this novel um yeah just wasn't wasn't all that good um though yeah apparently it's been a big bestseller in france and um so yeah and i can kind of see why it would be because it's yeah kind of sensational subject matter but um but yeah just like more to the story um but 
Then I also read Anthony Trollope's um, Framley Parsonage, which I've been reading for a while. It's the fourth uh, book in uh, his Barchester um, Chronicles. And, uh, and this, this novel was such a pleasure to read and such a joy. And I'm just continuing to find reading Anthony Trollope like such a comfort. Um, the, the way he writes and the style he writes, I, I just find so pleasurable. And, um, and the, this is the fourth book in a series, so I'd say if you've not read the previous three books, it won't have quite the same impact because even though the central characters of it and the central storyline of it, um, they are all new characters, but there are also subplots, many subplots to this book, um, which involve quite integrally characters from previous novels. And if you don't know those characters already, I don't think you'll get quite as much from their story in the way that these different plot lines all entangled together within this one county. And uh, so, but um, since I had read them, I, I, it, it completely worked for me and, and there were a lot of really uh, fun characters from the previous novels, which I was really glad to see again, um, particularly the character of Miss Dunstable, who's an heiress um, that uh, in previous novels and in this novel, there are men that want to marry her for her money and uh, are quite shameless about that. And she really understands that the men are only want to marry her for her money. And uh, and so I, I love how it continues to handle her, her character. And, um, and, and it's really interesting what happens um, with her character in this novel. And you get some really sympathetic moments, I think, with her as she, um, because like the way she sort of bats away these men is handled in quite a fun way. But then at the same time, you, you get the real emotion of of her dilemma where she she wants to have a, a emotional relationship with somebody else but it's it's like how do you do that when you know that a lot of these men that want to be with her only want to be with her for mo her money and um so yeah i found that quite sympathetic and and that's something i love that anthony trollope does that even though he will present these um, quite humorous situations, which really are funny, and these characters, which are, are such a pleasure to read about. But then part of the pleasure of that is you do get these different levels of emotions with them. You see their complicated psychology. And, uh, and I think how he does that is because the, the author will speak to the reader directly in a lot of cases, which is the style of writing you don't get all that much anymore. You know, he's not this um, invisible presence in the background creating the story. He's there, like, telling you about this. And he'll comment on the characters, on the story in general, and, and how he's controlling the story, but also commenting on larger issues to do with society and sort of and and making these interesting points about that, which, you know, not all of them I totally agree with, but it's a really interesting point of view. And um, so, so yeah, there's, there's that, but there's also the central story of um, this um, vicar who uh, um, wants to enter into higher society and his entanglements and that and how in doing that he gets stuck with uh, a loan in debt um, which he can't afford. It's about his crisis of, of trying to deal with that. That is the main storyline but as I said there's there's lots of other subplots to this and I think maybe there's probably too many um, to handle and, and I think this is the first novel that Anthony Trollope wrote which was serialized. Um, I think the previous novels he just sort of wrote and published but then this um, was specific specifically commissioned for a uh, magazine and so he's writing them in installments and so I think he he created all these storylines you know to keep the dramatic tension going you know from week to week and and um, and the, the magazine was incredibly successful when he was writing these and, and people were really gripped by the story but yeah I think there's maybe a bit too much going on in this book but nevertheless like on the whole they do all come together and I think they are quite satisfying and and as always with Anthony Trollope's writing it's not so much um, you know the the story itself or the the plot lines it's it's the the journey and the the pleasure of the journey going there um he is so good at writing a party scene so there's this really wonderful party scene where uh, where uh, there's some dramatic um, 
confrontations between some of the characters, but also that um, that society in this particular society at the time there was this like fad of having these parties, which they called the conversazione, and they wanted to have these conversaciones where um, uh, where where people would would meet and interact and have these discussions with each other, and um, and there's these self conscious like discussions between the characters of like, what are the rules of a conversazione? And um, are people allowed to like give a performance at a conversazione? And, uh, and I just found that so funny and endearing, um, sort of the pretensions of the characters. And, and I just love the way Anthony Trollope can like sort of make fun of the characters, but also show the real dynamic side of the characters. And so like even a character that's one of the most like villainous characters of the novel he'll talk quite a lot like about him in a in a sympathetic and rounded way of of saying like yeah he he makes some really bad decisions but but you know see it from his point of view and how he's stuck in this really difficult situation and and how, how he's left in this difficult situation of his own making and you know and that's something which I felt like in Born of No Woman just like isn't handled very well like the villains are like really just villains and um, you don't get any sort of emotional dynamics to their characters in the way that you do in Anthony Trollope and um, so yeah I'm, I'm just I'm enjoying so much continuing to read these novels and I'm glad there's a further two uh, novels to go. So those are my rambling thoughts about all the books I read this year, but um, I, I have um, written some much more concise <laughs> and I, I think um, thoughts to them um, on my book blog. So I'll put links to all of my individual reviews of these books below if you want to um, read more of my thoughts about these books. Um, but if you've read any of them, I'd love to know your thoughts about them and your feelings about them. Um, or if you're interested in reading them now, please let me know about that in the, the comments below. Uh, or let me know what you've been reading this month. I'd love to know about your first reads of the year and whether they were successful or not and what you're looking forward to, to reading next. So um, let's have a chat in the comments below. And uh, thank you for watching and supporting my channel. And thanks to everyone um, that's a subscriber to my channel. So yeah, I will speak to you again soon. I, I hope you're reading good things. And uh, yeah, have a great day. Uh, I was just almost blinded by the light as a car went by. <laughs> yeah, have a good day, everyone. Bye-bye.